All right, so we're here to talk about healthcare reform and how it will affect uh, patient-centered diabetes care. So what I want to just do um, to set the stage is to put up a graph that you're all very familiar with. This comes from the Congressional Budget Office, and this shows us what uh, federal spending on health as a percentage of GDP has been and will be in the years to come. Um, and what you can see, and these are numbers that CBO has been putting out for a long time, is that, um, you know, this trend reflects not only the insurance expansion of 2010, but mostly reflects a number of variables like the diffusion and innovation of new medical technologies. Um, all the wonderful work that all of you do is often quite expensive, and so paying for that uh, increases spending. At the same time, we seem to be getting much sicker as a society, and um, even though aging by itself is, is not a big driver of the spending growth, the fact that we are sicker as we age is certainly uh, a, a driver of this. So what can we do about um, changing the spending curve? There are four strategies that, that economists like to think about. I'm only going to talk about the first two. So what I'm going to focus my remarks this morning are about, on are um, an effort in Massachusetts to improve the way we pay providers. Um, I'm going to think of that as a supply-side intervention. Supply-side because we're going to be focused on the suppliers of healthcare, doctors, hospitals, providers. I'm then going to switch to a demand-side um, idea, which is benefit design. How can we play around with the incentives that consumers and patients confront um, in order to change the cost curve? And what I won't be able to talk about today, but we can refer to it in the Q&A, is what might be the opportunities to to bend the cost curve by changing the organization of medical practice. And finally, what can we really do on the wellness dimension? So in, in other words, is there something that we can do that even in some sense prevents us from being sick in the first place? Because the first three strategies are all about what you do for sick people. And the last one is about reducing um, just the incidence of, of disease and suffering. So let me talk about payment reform, and what I'm going to talk about today is the alternative quality contract in Massachusetts. This is a completely private initiative that was put together by Blue Cross Blue Shield of Massachusetts. Why Massachusetts? Massachusetts for several reasons. Massachusetts led the nation in 2006 in insuring the uninsured as a result of Governor Romney's efforts, and as you all know, um, the Massachusetts bill really was the template for uh, the Affordable Care Act. Massachusetts is also unique in many ways because Massachusetts has the highest level of per capita spending in the union. So people talk about the United States as being an outlier in spending. Massachusetts is the, is the, is the outlier within the 50 states. So the cost pressures in Massachusetts have always been high and Massachusetts had to confront rising costs a lot faster than any other state because we insured the uninsured. And while that was incredibly valuable, we know that it costs more money. So what, what happened in Massachusetts was that in 2009, Blue Cross Blue Shield of Massachusetts created an innovative alternative method to pay provider groups. Um, the idea was essentially to go directly to global payments. And so participating providers worked with Blue Cross Blue Shield of Massachusetts to figure out what baseline payments in 2009 would be. That's step one. Step two is how those baseline payments would increase over time. Everything is included in this global payment. So payments for outpatient services, inpatient services, prescription drugs are included in the global payment. So this is sort of saying we're not even going to go down the path of bundle payments where essentially what we're doing in bundle payments is thinking about, you know, bundle payments for heart attack treatments and bundle payments for, for congestive heart failure treatments and bundle payments for hip fracture pay payments. Here the idea is to go directly to global payments. Everything's included except for mental health. So mental health is outside the global payment, but every other service is included. And the idea is, once you have figured out the payment, and if I'm a particular provider group and I've negotiated a particular deal with Blue Cross Blue Shield for this year and the next year and the next year, it's a five-year contract, and I know how my payments will increase, if every dollar that I save under the alternative quality contract, if I'm a provider group, every dollar that I save is a dollar that goes into my pocket. And every dollar that I exceed the global payment from Blue Cross Blue Shield is a dollar that comes out of my pocket. So in some sense, the, the incentives to keep costs down, at least under the payment, the global payment, are, are perfectly aligned over here. 
So it was launched in 2009, and the way it works is that providers join, not patients. So if I'm a doctor and I decide, or I'm a, I'm a provider group, a multi-specialty provider group, and I decide to join the alternative quality contract, all my patients uh, are automatically enrolled in the alternative quality contract. It is not the case that a patient like me raises his hand and says, I want to be part of uh, the Blue Cross Blue Shield alternative quality contract. The one requirement was that the provider group should have at least 5,000 Blue Cross Blue Shield patients in it. And that's important because you want to be able to measure outcomes and the out, the, the, you need at least 5,000 patients. I would argue you need even more to measure outcomes accurately. Every provider group um, that participates in Blue Cross Blue Shield, um, the, it, this only applies to their HMO and point of service uh, patients. And the reason is because you want that primary care physician to basically uh, uh, serve as the referring physician to authorize referrals, okay? But once you're in the alternative quality contract as a patient, you can go to any provider in Massachusetts. It's just that the provider group would be held liable financially for care that was delivered outside of network. So it's not the case that patients are being restricted in terms of their choice in any way. So, the alternative quality contract had three pillars to it. The first is the global payment that I spent some time talking about. The other is, on top of the global payment, there was a pay for performance initiative, which meant that provider groups could get up to 10% of the global payment in addition if they met certain quality benchmarks. So you've got the global payment, which is a number. It's like, you know, two or three or $4,000 per member per year. But then in addition to that, you can get up to 10% of the global payment. So in my example, about $300 a year, if you do something like uh, meet all the pay for performance targets. Finally, and this is very important, um, you get the technical support that a contract like this requires. The technical support here is a real-time way of figuring out where the patients that I am responsible for as a provider are really being seen. So my provider group is responsible for 5,000 patients. Those 5,000 patients may come to me, but periodically they may go outside of network. But if they go outside a network, I need to know that. I need to know that because that's going to you know, count against me when it comes time to figure out whether I'm making money or not. But I may also want to reach out to these patients, bring them in and treat them and give them kind of you know, personalized care so that they don't go back out and require more care. So there are three pillars to the alternative quality contract. And here's what we find. So if you look at providers who joined the alternative quality contract in year one, that's 2009, what you see is that spending in the first year fell by about 6%. Spending in the second year fell by about 10%. So the first year spending is a little less than the second year spending. And you get identical numbers if you look at providers who joined the alternative quality contract in 2010. That's what that second single bar um, illustrate. So you get 10% savings. Um, that's kind of the takeaway number in two years. Now, you might ask, how were those savings accomplished? About 50% of those savings were accomplished by reducing utilization. So patients are getting less. The other 50% is accomplished by steering patients towards cheaper providers. So in Boston, as you know, I said, you know, Boston has some of the most expensive providers. Many of them are the Harvard hospitals. I'll probably lose my license to, to wear Harvard on my title after this talk, but they are expensive providers. And so one of the things that happens in the alternative quality contract is that you can see provider groups steer their patients away from very expensive providers. And that's about 50% of the savings. And the other 50% is, you know, uh, less use of, say, outpatient MRI facilities and that sort of thing. No big, use, no big re reduction in prescription drug use or the increase in, in generic uptake. That's the punchline number from the alternative quality contract. Now, the alternative quality contract, what's interesting about it is people say, wow, this is really spectacular. This is years ahead of where we want to be. To economists, and I think to physicians who work on things like the alternative quality contract, the quality contract 
tract is exciting, but it's a bit like the Mercury program relative to, say, the Apollo program, where I think with the AQC, we're just sort of learning how you do these different things, how you measure these different things. And the hope is that the second version of the alternative, alternative quality contract will look like the Apollo pr program, where you actually put like a man on the moon as opposed to just having a man circle the moon. So this is version one. We're very excited about it in Massachusetts. Um, and let's, you know, and I can talk about how you may turbocharge the alternative quality contract. In terms of outcomes, here's what you get. If you're looking at alternative quality patients in the AQC versus the non-AQC, and you look at uh, quality scores for chronic care, they improve about 4%. If you look at preventive care, it goes up by about half a percent. If you look at pediatric care, it goes up about 1%. And what you see is the effects in year two are much bigger than the effects in year one. And remember, this is a five-year contract, and we've only got data for years one and two right now. What this is telling me is that it takes provider groups a while to figure out how to do these things. It's not, if you're moving from fee-for-service, and you've been in fee-for-service for so long, even when you incentivize providers correctly, they can't ramp up right away. It takes them a while to basically figure out the tools and techniques to improve um, service delivery on these dimensions. If you look at diabetes quality measures, HbA1 testing goes up by 2%, eye exams by 7%, LDL cholesterol screening by 3%, nephrology screening by 3%. What's really interesting about the AQC is many of the quality outcomes are these standard process measures that I'm putting up for you over here that we're all familiar with, but many of them are actually um, outcomes. So you actually have patient HbA1c, you actually have C-reactive protein, you actually have LDL cholesterol, and you can actually measure things like hypertension. Um, you can measure things like risk-adjusted mortality. You can measure patient experience. So there's a battery of quality measures that's used to determine a provider's quality score. And I'm giving you a very small snapshot into quality measures that we reported. So my view of this is that met ideas like the quality, uh, alternative quality contract and certainly slow spending um, if providers can capture the efficiencies. And what I don't know about something like the AQC is, enrollment in the AQC is voluntary. So provider groups go to Blue Cross Blue Shield and say, I want to participate in the alternative quality contract. So what I don't really know the answer to is, what happens if we scale the AQC to provider groups who in some sense are not ready or not willing to to be part of the AQC? How will they do? They might do substantially worse than what we're seeing over here. The key to this um, slowing patient spending is, is the payers, uh, you know, the payers are really, now think about it from the payers' point of view. I told you what happens from the provider's point of view. Payers are only going to be able to save money, the payers being the insurance companies or the large self-insured employers, if they can lower their payment rates for that global payment. That's key, right? So the payer needs to figure out that, well, gee, under FIFA service, on average, I was paying, you know, for this population, I was paying $6,000 per patient per year. I want to reduce that, convert that to global payment at about $5,000 per patient uh, per year. And it's key that they figure that out. And it's not always, you know, I don't think many of them have the data structures in place to figure out the second piece of this. And of course, Quality could always be a concern. So what I've always found exciting about the alternative quality contract is the, the real-time measurement of quality and this movement towards actual outcome-based quality. But as we all know, we are in our infancy in terms of really knowing how to measure and reward quality. So let me switch gears at this point from part one of my talk, which was all about a supplier side intervention to something on the demand side. So I wanna talk about benefit design. And benefit design has many different flavors. It ranges from premium support, this idea that you know, some people can't afford an insurance premium of $10,000 for a family, and so we're going to subsidize their coverage. Um, you could think of premium support as being simply just raising co-payments, co-insurance, and deductibles. That's a form of, of benefit design. The idea being that you know, if I'm in a high deductible health plan, at least while I'm below the deductible, I face the right incentives to sort of figure out um, where I can get the cheapest outpatient MRI. We can think about benefit design as being um, tiered networks. So tiered networks are um, um, very popular in Massachusetts. They exist by law. And uh, in Massachusetts, what, what uh, plans have done is taken providers and put them into different 
tiers of networks where the most expensive providers tend to be in the top tier, and so you pay more to go to them, but you're not excluded from going to them. And then, of course, you have value-based insurance design, which is something that uh, I'm very excited about. And here the idea is that you do have co-payments, you do have co-insurance, but the size of the co-payment is, is tied to the value of the service. So in other words, we don't have a one-size-fits-all co-payment rule of, gee, you know, uh, all drugs have a $10 copay or all drugs have a $20 copay, but we say something like, diabetes drugs actually are very, very useful in keeping you out of the hospital, in, in, in making sure that, you know, microvascular disease does not become macrovascular disease, uh, in making sure that we don't have a diabetic patient who now needs dialysis. So what we're going to do for diabetes drugs is not have a $20 copay, maybe have a $2 copay. I would go one step beyond even having a $2 copay on diabetes drugs and say, if you really know that these things keep people out of the hospital, maybe you want to pay people to take their diabetes drugs, which to an economist means you offer a negative copayment. You pay people to take a certain class of drugs. So that's this idea of value-based insurance design. It's hard to do. It's hard to do because you need to figure out what are low-value services and what are high-value services. And low-value services may be low-value in some patients, but they could be extremely high-value in other patients. Cardiac stenting is a classic example of this. Cardiac stenting can save your life if you get the stent put into you right after a heart attack. The value of cardiac stenting in patients with stable coronary disease is still open for debate. So it's not just about establishing co-payments or co-insurance for cardiac stenting. It's about figuring out you know, who the right the, the clinical nuance of who should be charged the high copayment for cardiac stenting versus not. Um, the, the great benefit of value-based insurance design is its protective effects on adherence. So there's a great paper uh, by Mike Chernow's team in Health Affairs which sort of tells us what would happen, what would be the increase in adherence if we moved all these different types of drugs, which we think are preventive, into a VBID model. And you can see for something like diabetes and beta blockers, the increase in adherence would be really substantial. So even though the VBID may cost us money, Right, it's going to cost us money because we're reducing co-payments, so the plan has to pay more, the payer has to pay more, um, the patient is paying less. In the long run, what we need to figure out is how much of these benefits actually accrue back to the plan in the form of keeping patients, because of keeping patients out of the hospital. I've done some work on VBID in the context of Medicare beneficiaries. Let me go, tell you what we did with Medicare beneficiaries. What we found with Medicare beneficiaries was that if you increase copayments, even a little bit, even from $1 to $5 or $5 to $10, many Medicare beneficiaries cut back on their drugs. The problem is they don't know what to cut back on, so they cut back indiscriminately. They tend to cut back on diabetes drugs as much as they cut back on their statins, as much as they cut back on their antihistamines, as much as they cut back on their ED drugs. Well, the problem with that is for patients with chronic disease who are often on multiple drugs, you're often cutting back you increase the copay, but the, these patients are cutting back on really valuable drugs. And what we see is that these patients land up in the hospital three months after the copayments go up. So on average, it is certainly true that in the Medicare program, if you were to increase copayments, you would save money. It is, that, is a, that is a true statement. Uh, and the reason you would save money is because people are consuming less. But for this subgroup of patients, Medicare patients who are chronically, who have you know, gastritis or asthma or high cholesterol or hypertension um, or Alzheimer's, you're not saving money at all. It's actually costing you money when you increase copayments on prescription drugs because of the higher hospitalization costs. So I think there's a lot of exciting work um, that can be done on financing um, of VBID. I, my own view is that you, VBID, you will have lower costs because you will see fewer adverse events there's going to be a productivity gain that will accrue to patients um, and to employers as a result of having healthier patients. And the way you save money in VBID is not only to increase adherence with drugs like beta blocker statins and diabetes drugs, but also to increase cost sharing for a number of other low value services. So pick your favorite low value service. You know, it could be something uh, in orthopedics. I hope there's no one from orthopedics over here. Um, it, could be, it could be a particular uh, imaging uh, device. Um, but you may want much higher cost sharing on those devices and on those technologies, and that's certainly one way to save uh, money. So let me skip all of this and uh, just wrap up. 
you know, I think what I've done for you is given you a small insight into what we're learning on two very different interventions. One intervention is supply side focused. It's very exciting, but it's still in its infancy. And that's all about changing the way we're paying providers. The other one is on the demand side, changing the cost sharing that patients are confronted with. Going forward, what we should be able to do is combine the two approaches. Um, and so what we don't have in the alternative quality contract is we don't allow provider groups in the alternative quality contract to say, I have figured out what are high value services and what are low value services, and so I'm going to change the cost sharing on my patients. We didn't allow for that in the alternative quality contract. But ideally, as we go forward with the ACO movement, you know, I could see a future ACO or a future insurer saying, I can do both at the same time. You'd need a lot of data to be able to pull it off because you, you want to be able to measure adverse effects and patient outcomes in real time. That's always hard to do, but I'm very optimistic that just like the Mercury program became the Apollo program, you know, the, we're, we're, not, we're not that far from being able to do it. So I'll stop. Thank you.